Robert Mitchell here. So uh, I want to do a video today and do something a little bit different. I got some space here to draw and draw you some pictures to illustrate a few things. The, the point of, of today's little video is to point out something that um, I think has been left out of the conversation. Um, and when I say the conversation, I'm referring to the conversation uh, revolving around uh, Jordan Peterson um, and Sam Harris, the Christianity debate, um, and uh, the, the, the underpinnings of Western civilization. And one of the things that came out through the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, uh, we'll call them talks, they weren't really debates, uh, one of the things that became apparent was that Jordan Peterson said that Sam Harris was a Christian. And there was a lot of debate about that. And, of course, that makes people like Sam Harris irate. But uh, as soon as Peterson would kind of get Sam into a, a, a hole, then he would just come back with something along the lines of, yeah, but religion sucks. What I think got missed is the uh, underpinnings of Western civilization being inherently um, Judeo-Christian. And I want to illustrate that. And by the way, this is not my, I think so this is not my original scholarship. This is stuff that you learn in seminary, basic seminary uh, stuff in Old Testament study. And uh, I want to point this out because I'm kind of surprised that Paul Vanderclay didn't come out with this because Paul Vanderclay's got more um, uh, religious knowledge and education in his little finger than I have in my whole body. Um, and so when I bring this up, I, I have a feeling that Vanderclay is going to face Paul uh, when he watches this video, or I hope he'll watch it. If you know Paul Vanderclay, can you please tell him to watch this video because I think he'll like it. So. Uh, I want to begin with some ideas uh, um, that come from a, a famous uh, scholar called um, Yehezkel Kaufman. And Kaufman wrote a book in 1960 called The Religion of Israel from Its Beginnings to the Babylonian Exile. Um, very few people have read this because I think it's in like five volumes or something and it's quite large. Um, but we, we all often studied this in seminary in microcosm because there was a viewpoint that Kaufman had that has been extremely influential and far-reaching. And his viewpoint is, uh, to quote uh, Kaufman, Israelite religion was an original creation of the people of Israel. It was absolutely different from anything the pagan world knew. Its monotheistic worldview has no antecedents in paganism. And although he may have overstated that somewhat, um, what his points are universally interesting and valuable to us as we try to understand Western civilization. I also think it's important for us not to be denialists. We need to understand that Western civilization and, and Judeo-Christian philosophy are so intertwined as to be almost impossible to untease. You know, since um, uh, roughly 300, the year 300, when Constantine uh, made Christianity the religion of the Holy Roman Empire, then you, you pretty much, it's entangled. But, uh, so let's, let's look at what Kaufman said. So one of the things that Kaufman starts with is that in his view, there is a meta-divine world. And, and out of this meta-divine world, and we'll, we'll just call this, we'll just label this MD. Um, and it's independent, it's primary, above and beyond all things. And it's from this that, that the gods emerge. And so from this, from this world, we begin, we see deities. And these deities have mythologies, okay? And so you have Thor,
right? And then maybe you have Ishtar. Okay, or maybe you have, you know, a Sithonian deity like, uh, gee, I don't know, uh, Pluto or something. Okay, so these, these gods have mythologies. They have histories. So they are born, and they uh, do stuff, and then they die. And they are greater than humans, right? So there's a there's somewhat of a permeable barrier between deities and human beings, uh, but they still have a story, and they're born, and sometimes they even have relations with humans. But basically, um, there's a fluid boundary between humanity and deity. So we have some people down here. And then there's a little bit of permeability between that. And sometimes the deities come down and they have relations with humans and make demigods and so on. Okay? There is power in this world, in this meta-divine world. So there's, there's the whole idea of the um, uh, uh, elements, the element, elemental forces. Okay? So uh, there's fire. You know, and there's water, and then there's earth, and then there's air, right? And people can tap into this, and therefore people can work magic. And so they can, and gods can work magic, and they all can sort of, tap into these powers, these elemental forces, and make things happen. So, you know, uh, maybe there's maybe there's Zeus and his sphere of influence is like he's the big storm god, right? With lightning bolts. So is Thor. So um so we have all that. Now, pagan rites and rituals, so the things that you do in pagan places, these things are designed to tap into these, these forces so that we can work magic in the world. So that's the pagan, that's the basic pagan worldview. So in the pagan worldview, good and evil emerge from this primordial meta-divine. And so some of these uh, deities that are in here, you know, some of them are evil, and some of the people that are here are evil, and some of them are good. And so what does that mean? Well, um, from that standpoint, evil is an autonomous force. So evil can go do stuff, and it... And it's just something that is. There is an isness to evil, and it is, it is in the world because it all emerges from this meta divine realm. Okay. Salvation is the concern of human beings, and it is attained with certain knowledge and certain magical workings. And so. Um, that's how you get like Gnosticism and all those sorts of things. So you work your magic and then you can make yourself immortal. This universe is amoral. And so what that means is that there's nothing really moral about this. Each deity has its own sphere of influence. You know, it's fertility, it's death, it's storms, whatever it may be. And there really isn't anything anything inherently good or evil about it. You just sort of pick your patron deity or your own course in life. And, you know, maybe you're a follower of the Temple of Astarte or whatever the heck it is, and you get on. 
Each deity has its own morality and its own moral code and its own guidelines. So that's the world of the pre-Judeo-Christian mythos. So then we get into what happens with the Hebrews. So um, these these ancient these ancient Hebrews come up with the idea that all things spring forth from God. So okay, so we have God. And all things spring forth from God. Okay. Nothing is above him. Uh, nothing is um, more powerful than him and his power. Nothing, nothing is possible in the totality of creation without God. Um, so we don't really have a meta-divine world, and there are no other deities. So all that is make-believe. It just doesn't exist. It can't exist. And this is why when you read Genesis, uh, God has no mythology. He is not born. He didn't come from anywhere. And uh, he has no ending. And that leads us to the next point, which is God, dis God transcends all times and all realms, and he is wholly apart and separate from man. And so in here we have, so down here we have people. And we have nature. Okay, and then God is good, and he is the transcendent force above all other forces. Therefore, evil has no power, and it has no volition, and there is no, um, there, there is no aut evil autonomous power. So, really, this whole thing is good. Now, we sometimes struggle with this, and we kind of want to bring dualism back in and say that there's an evil force, um, and that Satan has force. But Satan really has no force, and if you, if you, if you any good book, um, any good movie, uh, any good Bible story, uh, Satan can, doesn't have any force, and evil has no force. It has to lure you in. So if you watch any good horror movie... You can't get possessed by the demon unless you open the door. Unless you play with that Ouija board or buy that evil book or move into that evil house, you have to invite it in. And that's just like real life. So you can't get possessed by um, the demon of a gambling addiction unless you first go to Las Vegas and plop your dollar down. You have to let it in, right? Um, it has no force of its own. There is only free will. Okay. Um, salvation is not achieved. It is realized. And then only by the grace of God. So there is no magic. There is no permeable barrier between gods and man. Uh, that's only broken once by Christ. And that's very important. So, um, sin is not caused by uh, deities and all this stuff that's happening. Sin is a choice. And so, therefore, all the evil that happens in the world is your fault. So, only humans are responsible for evil, not deity. You can't blame Pluto, and you, you can't blame fire, uh, you, you can't do any of that. There is only goodness, and evil is just something that's a bad choice. Uh, there are tragedies that happen, but that's because God creates nature, 
and freight's free will and so the wind blows and knocks a tree down and kills someone so that's not God's fault that's just a consequence of physics evil is when you choose to perpetrate an act of evil on someone and it's totally preventable by good choices and free will so again sin isn't supernatural it isn't caused by demons or an outside force it's caused by your bad choices and the things that you allow into your heart and mind and so humans and only humans are responsible for evil in the world the only supreme law is God and God is good so this causes us to have some some powerful powerful realizations and that is that the universe is moral so what I mean by that is that since the universe is moral it was created by God so you have these deities and these deities have spheres of influence in the pagan worldview but this day this new God this monotheistic God is not the God of fire or the God of water or the God of the hunt or the God of um, I don't know fertility he is he is the God of all gods insofar as he is the God of history He is the Ancient of Days, as I said. Um, and he is beneath and with beneath everything. He is the divine ground, and everything is on his by his will and all upon his surface. And so since he is moral and the God of history, then we need to align ourselves with goodness. We can't align ourselves with evil because that's just resistance. So, this encourages us to be good people. Those are your only two choices, be good or resist. This is the reason why, by the way, the, uh, the Freemasons only have one rule of dogma, and that is that you can't be in it unless you're a monotheist. These are the guys that 50% of the founding fathers of the United States were in this organization. And that's not a mistake, it's not an accident. Because if you think this way, if you think this way, it changes all this. Everything changes. If you think this way, if you think the monotheistic way, certain things, monotheism, then everything else follows. This is why when Sam Harris tells, uh, Jordan Peterson tells Sam Harris that he is a Christian because he knows that Sam Harris believes in free will and that he's trying, Sam Harris is trying to establish a universal morality and so on. So, um, Certain things follow from this, and if you look at the laws of the ancient Hebrews, then you can begin to see where their inventions came from and where these ideas sprang forth. And so, if you look at the, um, the ancient Hebrews and some of their miraculous inventions that they came up with, uh, you'll find out that they came to substitute uh, animals for human sacrifice. So now there's, there's, there's substitutions, and this is the whole idea of Christ, 
And then eventually we get to uh, immaterial sacrifices. And so we see that even that becomes unnecessary across time. You begin to understand that they have this idea of an eye for an eye. Now, uh, everyone says, oh, that's barbaric. Um, but let's remember that their predecessors had different punishments for different castes. So the punishment for a slave and the punishment for a, um, I mean, a, a punishment for a nobleman and a punishment for a commoner were two entirely different things. There were different statutes. But for the Israelites, we were all just people. There was, there was no, there was no differentiation between demigods and partially divine people and their leaders were, their leaders were um, beholden to God. So, prior to that, um, prior to that, the leaders were divine leaders. So, those, this is a relatively incredible invention. Now, it would be some time before they began to extend that also to slaves. Um, but um, at least they were beginning, they were, this is the path that leads eventually to where we get today. Um, and then the other thing is... Uh, no physical punishment for property crimes. That was another invention of the of the uh, ancient Hebrews, um, and that's interesting because. They're beginning to differentiate between materi the material and the spiritual. And so we don't, we don't physically punish people for property crimes. And then we also begin to understand, they also invented the idea that you can only punish the person who was guilty. So uh, punishment is only for the guilty. And, in other words, in, in the old laws of Hammurabi in the ancient Near East, if you killed someone's daughter, then they got to kill your daughter. And there didn't seem to be much regard for the fact that um, this innocent person was going to have to die in order to satisfy your crime. But for the Hebrews, there was no such thing as that. And so they did away with that. So all of this, all of these ideas are largely overturned by the idea of monotheism. And then from there, we begin to get to this incredible set of laws, which furthermore feeds into the set of laws that we have today. And this is not a linear thing that you can draw jot by jot by jot, but... It is certainly, you can see the development, and it's a path. This, this is a pathway that when you put your foot on it, will lead you to, ultimately, where we are in the modern era. And if you don't see that this is Western philosophy, and that this is the basis of the West, then you're kidding yourself. And if you want to be an atheist like Sam Harris, then you begin to reintroduce some of these old ideas. And let's think about how dangerous and violent the world is more peaceful now than it's ever been in history. And you can look at any graph you want to find uh, and prove that. Yes, there are still wars, but we look at the fact that the, the wars that swept the ancient world 
and, uh, and killed huge percentages of the human population. Um, you can see that these ideas, atheism, let's creep back in. So what, what's the difference between technology and magic? So, you know, they begin to feel like, well, we'll be, well, we can make ourselves immortal. We can reintroduce this idea of the permeability of manhood and godhood. We'll be able to upload our brains into computers and live forever. Uh, we'll be immortal. We can be like gods. So all these, all these, these atheist ideas are essentially kind of a, a return to paganism and a turning away from the monotheistic worldview from which all of the wonders of Western civilization have emerged. So uh, anyway, that's my lecture for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please, please feel free to post in the comments. Thanks so much.